From outer space, they can now see the fire that is raging near Los Alamos and threatening structures. If you wanted to destroy frequent fire forests like ponderosa pine, dry mix conifer forest, you couldn't do it much better than the way we did it. Those of us who are here now have a responsibility, uh, we, we always say, to try to make it better. Frankly, it's getting worse. We need to get busy and get to work because we've really only got the next 20 years to maybe make a difference up here. Few places mark time as dramatically as the Grand Canyon, but our western forests have been around for millions of years. They've survived broad changes in temperature, drought, even ice ages. Today these ecosystems are in widespread decline, facing perhaps their greatest challenge yet. We're at a point now where our forests are very fragile. And, it, and it's a scary time. Forested wildlands of the western United States have long inspired pioneers, writers, and scientists. Vivid reports from early explorers describe deep canyons, majestic pines, knee-deep grasses, lush wetlands, and fertile soil. However, just a century later, it seems our western forests are under attack from every direction. Armies of bark beetles, devastating disease outbreaks, and unstoppable infernos threaten the beauty, function, and life of these important wildlands and the people who depend upon them. Recent droughts have exacerbated the problem. Growing concerns of climate change have underscored ecologists' urgent call to save our forests under fire. Uh, the temperature globally has warmed about one degree Fahrenheit over the past um, 50 years. And in Arizona and the Southwest, it's warmed more quickly, about two and a half degrees. So things are changing rapidly. Scientists say our future forests depend on today's success in the race to restore the American West. Just north of Flagstaff, Arizona, the G.A. Pearson Natural Area serves as an outdoor laboratory for forest research. Since 1908, foresters have studied how trees grow in the middle of the largest contiguous stand of ponderosa pines in the world. But these sometimes fall in the traps too, and we collect everything that falls. Regents Professor of Forest Ecology, Dr. Wally Covington, is the Executive Director of the Ecological Restoration Institute at Northern Arizona University. So it allows us to look at the return of nutrients. He has devoted a lifetime to the understanding of forest ecosystems that have evolved with fire. We protect the old growth trees, so that then sucks the water. To measure that, we use these soil. Started principally by lightning, fire was a frequent visitor here. It would creep along the forest floor, burning up dead logs, pine needles, and other forest debris. It was fire that kept trees from crowding each other out. It revved up the resin flow and the vigor of mature trees, making them stronger, thicker, and more resilient. Before pioneers arrived, openings took up far more of the forest than the trees. Grasses and wildflowers had plenty of room. What has happened during the last century has changed the natural processes and structure of the forest. Researchers say too much livestock grazing early on ate up the grasses. They used to carry the frequent low-intensity surface fires that once rejuvenated grasses and wildflowers and thinned out overly abundant conifer seedlings. Big old-growth trees that grew in groups were removed by heavy logging. Fire, seen as a threat to lives and property, was put out as soon as it got started. And all over the West, young trees became established, choking out the landscape. You can see how dark and closed in these forests have become. 
Where there were once 15 to 30 trees per acre, there are now hundreds, in some cases even thousands, all competing for water, sunlight, and nutrients. The loss of grasses and wildflowers, the addition of more trees, and the abrupt ending of fire added up to a deadly combination. And this is probably the original scar that came down was a lightning strike. As ecosystems weakened, symptoms of an unhealthy forest began to appear. In western Colorado, red pine needles mark beetle-killed trees. Across the west, different kinds of bark beetles have unleashed a mighty attack. They tunnel under the bark through the cambium layer of drought-stressed trees, cutting off the circulation of water and food. Tired and dehydrated, the trees can't create enough resin to push the bugs out, so creatures the size of a grain of rice are killing entire forests. NAU forest entomologist Dr. Rich Hofstetter says the infestation is expected to get worse. As warmer temperatures allow the tiny killers to thrive for longer periods of time, more generations of hungry bark beetles are finding a feast waiting for them in these dense forests. It takes hundreds of years. These are slow-growing trees. They're actually really well defended, typically. But, uh, you know, when conditions change, it only takes weeks, sometimes days, for a tree to die. In addition, unprecedented disease outbreaks have wreaked havoc in the woods. Aspen groves are a favorite attraction in the fall as their delicate leaves light up the hillsides with shades of gold and orange. But these vibrant trees are fading away in disturbing numbers at lower elevations. Foresters are calling it sad or sudden aspen decline. It is a sad sight indeed. Also disappearing from the forest are sunlit openings. Trees encroaching into meadows are shrinking open spaces, taking up water and drying out wetlands. With the overabundance of trees, treetops are creating thick, connecting canopies. These now intercept much of the snow, where it evaporates into the air instead of making it to the ground where it can melt and replenish the soil. As this drying trend is occurring all over the West, scientists are concerned about the disappearance of seeps and springs. This, this is um, fairly typical of a wetland soil. It's Most of us would of simply call this through. mud, but this dark, messy, sloshy soil is as good as gold in the arid Southwest. To wetland biologists like Dr. Jim Allen, the executive director of Northern Arizona University's School of Forestry, a soggy, mucky meadow is an indicator of forest health. You can imagine, you know, acres and acres of this, five, six, ten feet deep before you get to bedrock, how much water might be stored in a wet meadow and gradually released downstream over time. This spongy spring-fed meadow is keeping plants and animals well watered. There used to be a lot of these, but not anymore. The very first explorers, the very first pioneers coming through here, they would have moved through an area that had very open forests in the uplands right above us here. And then they would have come through one meadow after another as they worked their way, say, from east to west across northern Arizona. Now deeply eroded gullies quickly whisk water away. Dry meadows carry only memories of old stream channels. And scientists like NAU's Dr. Abe Springer say our overcrowded pine forests are draining our wetlands. If we return the forest density to a, uh, a more pre-settlement condition with a more natural fire regime, most of our indicators and studies show that we should modestly increase the amount of surface runoff and increase the amount of recharge to the aquifers by decreasing the amount of water that the trees and the vegetation uses and returns to the atmosphere. Crowded with fuel and weakened by competition, forests, once reinvigorated by frequent surface fires, now have a deadly relationship with crown fire. 
today, billions of small trees line up like matchsticks all across the landscapes of the West. Just like the rungs on a ladder, it allows the fire to move from a surface up into the canopy. Is the wallow fire and the other fires that we have burning throughout Arizona, are those symptoms of the disease that you talk about, have been talking about for years about overgrowth in our forests? Yes, they, they are exactly. And, you know, the, they're, it's not new that we're having crown fires. That's been occurring since the 1950s. Um, of course, the natural fires in these forests are surface fires. They're just burning through the grasses and wildflowers in the understory and a few years of accumulation of pine needles. They used to occur about every five to 10 years or so. But um, as fuels accumulated after we um, put out, eliminated those frequent fires, those fuels built up and eventually the trees that came in reached uh, the heights where they could carry fire into the treetops of the oak growth trees. That began in about 1950, as you know, um, 1940, 1950. But what's been happening is the fires have been getting bigger and bigger and several of us looking at this as it occurred across the landscape recognized that they were going to just continue to get bigger and bigger until they burned the entire landscapes and that's where we are right now. New Mexico and Arizona experienced their largest forest fires in history during the summer of 2011. The Las Conchas fire near Los Alamos burned some 60% of the Bandelier National Monument. It started out, oh, 20 miles as the crow flies from here, something like that, on the afternoon of the 26th of June. And by that evening, it had gone 40,000 acres, which was just unprecedented and much of that was really, really severe. Within the next few days, it had gone 156,500 acres. Pushed by 40 mile an hour wind gusts, fires like the 2010 Schultz fire on the San Francisco peaks above Flagstaff can rip through 15,000 acres of important watersheds in a matter of days. fast-moving 70,000-acre Missionary Ridge fire north of Durango was one of Colorado's largest. It started in the Gamble Oak and moved upward, killing everything in its path right on up to the timberline. In eastern Arizona, the monstrous half-million-acre Wallow fire burned up critical Mexican spotted owl habitat and human homes. United States Senator John Kyle has been a longtime advocate for the science behind forest restoration. From his front porch, he can see the destruction. Flames came within yards of his cabin. Some of his neighbors weren't so lucky. I mean, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm disappointed, I'm saddened when you see it out there. And yet, you see, within two months of the fire, I walk around and I see aspen that are already 18 to 20 inches high you see the grass and the flowers coming back. And so there is a regeneration that occurs. The aspen certainly will be back quickly, but how many generations will it be before the same kind of thing that I've been able to enjoy will be available for great-great-grandkids? It'll be at least three or four generations, I suspect. The cost of fighting these enormous wildfires, along with the impacts on wildlife, communities, and watersheds, adds up to staggering sums of money, conservatively more than a billion dollars. Following these huge fire events are damaging and deadly floods. They carry ash, silt, boulders and logs and clog up water sources below. The sound of thunder now strikes terror in the hearts of residents. Burned soil doesn't absorb water anymore. 
It repels water, it's hydrophobic. Silt, debris, and boulders carried by floodwaters have taken out this alpine home. It moved the foundation, tore out the walls, and pushed rocks into the structure. This kind of mortality that we're seeing in here is completely unnatural. A lot of people focus on just the immediate impacts of these large unnatural fires that we've been having. And that's devastating. It's devastating, of course, immediately to wildlife habitat and to human habitats. But there's a secondary impact that people are often unaware of. And that is, is that we start having major flood events. In the aftermath of New Mexico's Los Conchas fire, a wall of 20,000 sandbags stands between flash floods and ancient Pueblo artifacts. When fire burns unnaturally hot, it leaves behind a graveyard of dead trees. But it's the invisible damage that scientists are learning more about, damage that impacts the environment long after the flames are gone. We have a site here that is not taking up carbon dioxide and storing it at all right now. This is something that's called an eddy covariance system. As air flows through the fingers of this claw-like device, NAU tree physiologist Tom Kolb can measure the carbon dioxide that's moving between the air and the land. The fire has had a long-term legacy effect on the capacity of the site to take in carbon dioxide and store carbon dioxide. Prior to the fire, this was a dense forest that would take in somewhere between 100 and 200 grams of carbon per square meter of land per year. After the fire, now it's actually releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. Remains of intense fires dot the west. This is the site of the Cerro Grande fire that burned 48,000 acres near Santa Fe, New Mexico in the year 2000. It may be, you know, 100, 200 years or more, if ever, before some of these stands are forested. Greenhouse gases were emitted during the fire, and live trees that used to store carbon in the wood are now dead trees releasing carbon dioxide years later. With an estimated 300 million acres of fire-adapted forests in North America on the verge of collapse, ecologists, educators, environmental activists, loggers, ranchers, and elected officials, along with foresters and other conservationists, are forming an unusual alliance. Across the West, people are coming together to solve the problem on scales never tried before. To hold it in place and to Providing millions of dollars to help support these collaborative forest landscape restoration projects is the U.S. Forest Service. Southwestern Regional Forester Corbin Newman says these projects must mimic the size of today's wildfires to be effective. This program gives us the opportunity to look at a broad section of land, that a, a landscape, if you will, that is of the the scale that you can really make a difference, that a system can have all its pieces and parts, and we can truly build into it the resilience to deal with some of these impacts. In the Sierra National Forest near Fresno, California, foresters say this is what successful collaboration looks and sounds like. Did you copy that? Picking through 157,000 acres, the community is committed to protecting the forest and homes. It's a phenomenal project. The Dinky Project is one of the nation's collaborative forest landscape restoration projects. High Sierra District Ranger Mose Jones Yellen says this area is in the wildland urban interface. That's where homes are built right into the thick of the woods. We're bringing together uh, a whole series of different stakeholders, different interested parties, and with that group of people, we're looking at 10 years worth of restoration projects in a particular spot in the forest. Um, where a lot of different interests meet and where management historically has been somewhat complex and, and somewhat contentious. In the past, some of our projects have been held up by timely and costly litigation because our planning may not have um, had enough involvement or buy-in from our public. So by doing a collaborative, we get out, we iron out all of those issues beforehand so that once we have a plan in place, we can move forward. And that's exactly what, would be, what we've been seeing here on the Dinky Collaborative Project. Forehand is what we're saying. Kirby Mullen says the forest had become so overgrown, it was difficult to find this road. We're taking out some of the smaller trees and uh, producing a product with it. The other thing too is there's people employed in our sawmill, probably 130 of them, 
that are getting jobs because this is one of the jobs that we're doing. One of the challenges of thinning the High Sierra and other forests is making sure animals like the Pacific Fisher have what they need to survive. Using transmitters that pick up signals from GPS collars on fishers, wildlife biologists from the Pacific Southwest Research Station are studying how these mammals are using restored areas. In the mountains of western Colorado, the Uncompagre Plateau project is focused on 160,000 acres. This includes key watersheds that feed the mighty Colorado River. We're seeing forest health issues in, in almost every species. The stands have all become really dense over time because of excluding fire in these landscapes. The idea on the Uncompagre project project, like many of the restoration projects throughout the West, is to first determine what the natural conditions were. What was the carrying capacity of the land? What's the natural tree densities and patterns? How much understory production was there? When I was 14 years old, it was more open. It's almost oppressive how closed much of the plateau is these days. So our top problem in some ways is that we're, we've lost something that's not quite the forest, it's the meadows that are a key part of the forest ecosystem. But to remove the excess small diameter trees, the wood products industry has to figure out how to make the process cost effective. Eric Sorensen operates the Delta Timber Company. The Delta Mill is one of only two remaining large mills in Colorado. We're trying to look at every aspect of that log and get everything out of the log that we can. This collaborative effort on the Uncompagre Plateau is expected to result in 10,000 treated acres a year for the next decade. Some of the work that we've been doing with the restoration project is really a bit more intense and a bit larger scale than some of the projects we've done up until this point. Colorado Wild Director Ryan Bidwell calls this thinning project an important first step to saving the forest. It's a work in progress. It's, uh, it's not to say that this is beautiful uh, right now. But I think we all we all know where where we need to take this forest. Whether you're taking care of people or trees, you're still trying to better the world. And in one of the most fire-ravaged states in the country, efforts are underway to take on the nation's largest forest restoration project ever. Equipped with the best available science and support from a wide variety of interest groups, the Forest Service is leading the way across 2.4 million vulnerable acres in northern Arizona. It's called the Four Forests Restoration Initiative, or FORFRI. This is a very large-scale project, and we're going to be looking at uh, very many more acres to treat than we've ever done in the past here. The reason to do that is to try to change our landscape as quickly as we can to avoid some of the serious impacts of the, the fires that we've seen over the years. It's just huge. Our first NEPA project is 750,000-acre analysis area. Um, that in and of itself is a daunting task, trying to pull together all the data to have some site-specific information as to what we need to do out on the ground to restore these systems is, is a daunting task. Public opinion is so important and if we don't have public support the entire project could collapse. I think it really shows the range of possibilities that, that people can meet when they work hard together. This, this gives us an opportunity to make a very meaningful change in the kinds of fires that we're having in this country. Beneficial, low-intensity fire is an important piece of forest health that's been missing from much of the West. In places where thinning has occurred and excess fuels have been removed, fire managers are using lightning strikes to their advantage. North of Williams, Arizona, the 2011 Beale Fire behaved the way fire managers say fire should. Flames burned logs and old stumps, winding around the base, but not killing the big old-growth trees. The 2010 sheep fire in the Sierra National Forest also proved to be beneficial. Neil Metcalf served as the incident commander on that fire that burned park and forest land for months. The large trees, uh, for the most part, were safe, and the smaller trees, um, and then ground fuels like big logs and stuff, um, would burn. So this tree here, uh, this little cedar, since it was a small tree, um, didn't survive the one and two foot flame lengths where the tall trees did. And the giant sequoia forest is also a fire adapted system. Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park Fire Education Specialist Deborah Schweizer says prior to returning fire to this forest, baby sequoias were missing from the ecosystem. 
The significance of giant forest for us is it's one of the areas where we have gotten very close to restoring fire to its natural regime. A big part of my job is getting folks to understand that not all fire is bad. As we're seeing, beauty can grow from the ashes of degraded ecosystems. Ecologists and economists say that beauty can take the form of ecological sustainability and economic opportunity. Most agree now is a pivotal time for restoration and innovation. In the Black Hills of South Dakota, energy is being produced from the excess trees in overcrowded forests. That energy, now biomass, is used to heat schools. Energy is what everybody right now thinks if we could just find a way to figure out how to convert all of that biomass into an energy that then could heat homes and power industry while providing jobs, there's, some, there's a huge opportunity there that I hate to see us miss. If you look at the Four Forest uh, Restoration Project, part of that is about trying to um, clean the forest get out the, the undergrowth, and if you do that and leave it on the, the floor of the forest, then you have to burn it there. That is actually, can be brought back in terms of biomass plant, and ultimately it's a replacement for fossil fuels. So all around, everybody would benefit. As crown fires, insects, and disease threaten vast landscapes of the American West, land managers stress the urgency to take action on these imperiled wildlands. We're in a race with Mother Nature. Mother Nature will reset it with insect and disease and fire, or we can reset it by wise tinkering that lets us put these systems in a condition that, that those natural forces play a more natural role in the process. And so for me, the urgency has been around for 10 years and it's doing nothing but growing. You know, this tree is on death's doorstep. It'll be dead in the next year's time. Scientists say restoring ecological and economic health to these forests under fire is so critical to the American West that it requires a national laser-like focus, a focus that involves an understanding of ecological processes, objective use of the best available science, treating landscapes at the scale of today's wildfires, returning low-intensity fire to the land, finding uses for small-diameter trees, ensuring a steady wood supply for wood and biomass-based industries, and developing new natural resource-based jobs. It will take the collaboration of stakeholders with various values and goals, a commitment to monitor our actions on the ground, and an encouraging environment of learning, innovation, and creativity. It's being called a race against time, but the reward is a landscape legacy for generations to come.